Without any further ado, let's bring him on from the Orange Pill Bunker in Parts Unknown. Ladies and gentlemen, it is Max and Stacy. How are you guys doing? Still cold, still cold, Graham. <laughs> <laughs> we need to get back to the tropics, you know, non-tropical locations suck, but yeah. it's, um, it's a good, well, I guess, you know, it keeps us cooler while the price of Bitcoin is quite hot, hot, hot. <sighs> Yes, it is. It just broke sixty-one thousand today. Uh, actually, Graham, you're wrong. It broke. It hit sixty-four thousand. What, man? That is amazing. So that is a. We haven't had that price in three years. No, we haven't had that price in three years, and it's uh, getting very, very close to new all-time highs. Of course. And of course, when it breaks through new all-time highs, that will trigger a lot of buy stop orders. People will pile in in an aggressive way. You'll see it pop to 100,000. This will trigger institutional fear of missing out or FOMO on a major scale. We're seeing that now happen in the banks, the institutions, the hedge funds. So they're going to come in with these huge orders. I saw somebody noticing that there was a huge multi-billion dollar trade just in the last 48 hours, and they paid something like buck and a quarter in fees and it's the magic of bitcoin so this is now getting into i would say the second inning of this leg of the big bull market this this particular phase of uh the bull market yeah it's it's quite amazing because it it um you know it's so funny all of us in the Bitcoin space, I was talking to several friends of mine a year ago when it was at 19,000 and they were like, well, I don't know. And I go, guys, just buy it. Like it's gonna, and had they, it would, they would have tripled their money. I mean, I posted this on Twitter. I converted a, 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 a USD IRA to a Bitcoin IRA and my money is now more than doubled. It's almost three times its value. And yeah, but Graham, you're thinking in fiat terms. Like there is the the fiat conversion rate doesn't matter, right? Because you're never you're never going to sell that for big for dollars anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, what it's indicating is that we're that much further along towards the apocalypse for the dollar because it will come for the dollar too. It'll come for them last, but it will still come for the dollar. So. Uh, that fiat dark ages is over, and this is good news. The good news is not like the fiat price. The good news is the good times are just getting started, and you know we're in the beginning of a Bitcoin renaissance 2.0 happening around the world. It's concentrated right now in El Salvador because we're Bitcoin country. But I think you know these bleak times that we're going through, that we have gone through. I think we're going to come out on the other side and an age of lightness. Yeah, like that Arnold Schwarzenegger line. I forget the movie, but he would say it this way. I like you, U.S. dollar. I'm going to kill you last. <laughs> right? So the U.S. dollar will be the last to succumb ultimately to the Bitcoin. But you've already got dozens of uh, currencies are falling to Bitcoin as it makes new all-time highs in various currencies around the world. And um, so this is, uh, this is the fun bit. Yeah, this is this is really exciting. And I the thing I love about you guys is Stacy, your your unrelenting optimism. I, I re, I'm reminded of when you were the two, I don't know if you guys remember the first time you were on my show was in like three years ago, it was around April of 2021. And I was in kind of a dark space, everything I'm covering all this politics and everything's collapsing, and every all the everyone's awful, and Biden's awful, and Trump's awful, and everyone's awful. And you guys came on my show and like, yeah, this is amazing. We're doing great. And I was like, wait, what? How are you? <laughs> are you guys what are you guys smoking? You're like, no, we're doing we're 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 and you told me about this show because I, I only watched you at that point on art when you were on RT, and you were like, Yeah, our orange pill podcast, we're just very, very optimistic. And it is one of the things that has drawn me in, into being a Bitcoin maxi is your optimism. It's with Stacy specifically, your optimism. Max, I love how much shit you talk. That's why we connect because we're both comedians that love talking shit. So the way you talk shit, I, I love. But Stacy, your, your optimism has actually changed, helped me like let go of oh, I'm going to fight the good fight and change America. I mean, I hope America doesn't implode. I mean, I'd love to be wrong. It looks like it's going to, but whatever, as you say, Bitcoin is just on this trajectory. And 
Let's cl- if you can clarify that because there's a lot of people now that we're back to the, up in the you know 61, 64,000. We're we're about to break the last the all time high of 69, 70. We'll probably break that pretty quickly. So there's all these new people flowing into the space. Yes. So help explain to them because I really want to catch as many of the newbies as possible so they don't get caught up listening to some guy you know, who shall remain nameless, but has like a fanny pack and a drug problem or whatever like that. Like you want to get caught up with, <laughs> to those guys help, like explain that in a little more detail, what you were just saying about how you're like, Graham, let that's like fiat thinking and how this is people who are just coming into the space who are like, wow, what is this? What's going on? And how is this when, when they say, like, I've had people ask me, what do you, when, when you guys say, when Max says, and when Stacy says, it's going to go Z, the dollar goes to zero against Bitcoin. What does that specifically mean to someone who's not like in finance? So I feel we're in, you know, since the birth of Bitcoin, that was the beginning of the new era of the Renaissance. Most of us didn't see it. The only one who saw it was Hal Finney <laughs> day one, right? That he saw the future. And, um, but most of us, it took a while and a certain, um, you know, network effect, the, you know, the, the swarm of, of Bitcoiners hit a critical mass and the money printing also hit a critical mass. Like the, the March, 2020 of, you know, COVID when they shut down the global economy and started printing money was really the singularity moment of Bitcoin. I believe like that's when like the Renaissance, like this, the dawn happened where everybody in the world understood it. And that's why we had Paul Tudor Jones and then Michael Saylor. And then all of this, what we, where we are right today is because of that moment in, in March of 2020. Um, But I think that, you know, what the, the, it's always the forces of dark and lightness throughout human history. We've had the dark ages in Europe and then the age of enlightenment that was happening in the Arab world. And then it's swapped around. There's always like humans seem to do that right with our there's lightness sparks darkness somewhere else. Darkness sparks lightness somewhere else. And right now the Bitcoin community is the source of hope and optimism, relentless optimism, we call it. But one of the things that you're going to have the forces of darkness, the forces of uh, fiat that, the, the legacy system, the incumbents who want to retain their power, the two sources of re- a lot of control they have over you, they, you know, there's surveillance state and all that stuff, but they, they don't need that. They need just you and your human weakness for fear and greed. Those are the things that drive financial markets. And that's the thing that uh, drives humans so much. So once you start to think of the fiat price and the conversion rate, rather than holding on one Bitcoin equals one Bitcoin, as President Bukele tweeted today. That's where they have you, right? If they're starting like, oh my God, it's, it was 60,000 just two days ago and now it's 40,000. You're going to lose, you're going to lose, you're going to lose. Like mm. they send fear into you. And so you go, oh, I better get rid of this Bitcoin, this precious Bitcoin that'll never be made again, right? And there's only 21 million of it. And I'm going to give away my Bitcoin because I'm afraid. But the same thing happens on the upside. They're going to target you for your greed is they're going to say, here, buy my shit coin, <laughs> right? Here, we have this amazing shit coin. Uh, <laughs> you, can, you, can, you missed out on the previous bull runs or getting in early. And so you're just finding Bitcoin, like these newbies who you mentioned, who will be uh, entering you know, Bitcoin space just now. They'll be like, look, some people in, that you're looking at in the world right now on the news, they got in at $1,000 or $100 or $10,000. And poor you schmuck, you have to get in at 60000 But wouldn't you like to be able to get some Bitcoin at $100? Well, we have an opportunity for you right here. Buy my mm. shitcoin and it's going to go up and you could buy Bitcoin. So they're going to target that greed that you're going to, you know, you're going to think of that fiat price and you wanted that hundred dollar fiat price, not the, the sats, the number of sats that you start, you know, you want to stack, 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 stack and hold on to as, as long as you can. I know there people have expenses and things like that, that they have to, you know, live life, but uh, they're going to try to shake you out of that. So when that, so when you start to talk about the fiat price and if your friend had gotten in at 20,000 or 19,000 that they would triple their money, it's like, uh, 
well, they would still have the same amount of sats. And that's the most important mm. thing, right? Uh, yes, the fiat conversion rate would have been, uh, you know, higher, but you're in your mind, you're even talking there like that they would sell it now and be able to buy a car or something like that, where right now more than ever is like so important to hold on to it because, you know, these cycles of Bitcoin of, you know, bull market, bear market, bull market, bear market, there will be a certain parabolic moment where we just like take off like a rocket and the whole fiat world just pretty much collapses. So you want to have your Bitcoin. I think that's within our lifetimes here. I don't think it's going to come in a hundred years. I think it's more like on a horizon that we could all see five, 10 years. It's, it could be this year. So you want to make sure you hold on to it and don't succumb to that fiat thinking of, of FOMO or, you know, fear or greed, any, either one of those is going to shake you out of your Bitcoin, your mm. holding your sats. That's a good point. So then that's how we really should be as we're talking to people coming into this saying, you just want to own as much Bitcoin as you can, regardless of price, because over time you will have, yes, you will have more power. You will have more sats and that's power. That's energy. That's savings. That's your future. That's the future of humanity. That's relentless optimism. That's Renaissance 2.0. That's enlightenment 2.0. That is history right in your hands and you want to hold it. Yeah. And also um, it's a matter of conviction. So this is a problem every investor has. I think it was Peter Lynch, famous money manager over there at Fidelity Magellan Fund, who in one of his books, he talks about the fact that most people do more research researching a refrigerator to buy than they do researching the stocks that they're going to buy. And people tend to buy stocks um, without doing a lot of research. They hear somebody talk about it and they buy some. And so they don't really know why they're buying it. Uh, they like when the price goes up. But when the price goes down, they're like, you know what? I have no idea why I own this thing. I'm going to sell it because they never took the time to learn about it and get educated by it. So they lack conviction. If you spend the time learning about it and educate yourself about Bitcoin and your conviction goes up, then every time the price goes down, you see it as a buying opportunity. You see it as something that's valuable, that's on sale. Another interesting observation, it could have been Peter Lynch as well, who said that the stock market is, one, is a very strange place because it's the only market in the world where when things go on sale, people run away from the price. <laughs> Usually if you're, if you're at Walmart or some big store and think something's on sale, 30% off, you're like, oh, great, I'm going to stock up right now. But this is the opposite in the stock market. So um, this is uh, not unexpected, what you're describing there. And the best way to avoid dumping at the inappropriate time and, and to start stacking is to simply increase your conviction, which comes through education. And fortunately, there's so much information out there that it's not hard to put 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 100 hours or 1,000 hours into this and uh, get your conviction up high. That's a great point. I look at my own trajectory of, it was four years ago. I mean, it was when everything got shut down that I, I had owned some Bitcoin and some crypto and kind of understood it. It was, when, again, like, like Stacy, like you said, the, sh the, the COVID shutdown kind of made me and a lot of others go, whoa, whoa, I better really learn. I better figure this out because I'm, I already knew how corrupt the banking system was because I had been studying that and I had been a victim of that in the housing crisis. I lost my home and I was like, I'm never going to let that happen to me again. And when I started to understand Bitcoin, I was like, oh, and, and, and really, you know, you, like you say, most of us, unless, you know, very, very small handful of people got Bitcoin immediately. Both of us kind of got it varying levels and had sort of a, a learning curve. And, you know, I, I got in and listened to some of these Bitcoin shows and buy and sell and technical analysis and this and that. And then what, how, what increased my orange pill was when it was, it was Michael Saylor who said, I saw an interview with him. He goes, look, I wrote a book on, you know, on, on software tech stocks. And I'm the most knowledgeable about that industry and I can't predict when that price is going to go up and down. So, and he just says, just buy your Bitcoin. He just screams it, buy, don't sell your Bitcoin, just buy it and hold it. Obviously, like you say, if you have some sort of expenses, you need to, you know, whatever, everyone's personal situation is different, or you've had a big, and you want to pay off your mortgage or I don't know, whatever. But like, ultimately what you're saying, and 
to just make this clear to the audience, buy Bitcoin and hang on to it. And that's what like. Yeah, what well, March 2020, it was actually fit from February 25th, 2020, and then through March. Okay, so there was a six week period, a five week period where everything changed, like um, the illusion, as as President Bukele mentioned uh, at CPAC, the illusion of fiat came to a screeching halt. Like even I, who had been covering uh, financial markets and financial crimes and fraud and fiat money printing and central bank and Ron Paul and Occupy Wall Street for 12, 13 years at that point, even I was enlightened. Like it was a global mm. moment of epiphany for everybody to see. First of all, the U.S. committed Harry Carey for the dollar, right? By seizing $600 billion worth of treasuries from Russia. So that immediately nuked the dollar because it was no longer actual wealth. It was no longer savings. You couldn't save in it because they could nuke $600 billion worth from somebody. So it was not immutable and censorship resistant like Bitcoin, right? So they did that, which was a total shock. I was stunned by it. I It took me a, quite a while to process it. And then, uh, then they just, at the same time that all of that was happening, uh, COVID hit and they shut down the global economy. They just turned it off. And again, I was just like stunned. I thought like this what, are they going to shut it down for 24 hours or 36 hours? Like what's going on? And then a week passes and two weeks pass and three weeks. And you're like, like, how is this possible? <laughs> like you can't just shut down in a, a global economy. This isn't possible. Everybody saw that. But also what happened in March of 2020 was, I guess, you know, well, it was all the panic of when the lockdown happened, when the U S went into lockdown, um, there was chaos in the markets and Bitcoin fell. But um, I guess it, it was because of all of the leverage and derivatives and BitMEX in particular, uh, BitMEX exchange was like tumbling. Remember, Bitcoin fell something like 20, 25% in one day. Um, yeah. And I remember receiving uh, all sorts of messages from friends saying, is, is this going to stop? Is Bitcoin going to stop falling? I was like, well, I hope so. Like, <laughs> just, <laughs> just keeps going. but at that moment, you know, I never thought of selling it. Like I was like, well, I hope it stops falling. It, you know, it was a friend w wanting to know if they should sell. And do you think it's going to go to zero? And I'm like, I hope not. Like, that's all I can do is hope it doesn't. Um, and then BitMEX like shut down and turned off. And then, uh, you know, basically Bitcoin found a bottom because their algorithm, whatever was like going crazy there, stopped. But unbeknownst to us, while all of this chaos was happening, the seizing of the $600 billion, the, the shutdown of the global economy and the money printing that happened, that they were just going to send everybody some money to stay home. Uh, Paul Tudor Jones, who's one of the you know smartest, most legendary hedge fund investors in the world, he was watching all of this. And that's when he started to buy Bitcoin, right? And he said to, you know, we know some people who were friends with him and talking to him at the time. And he was like, you look at this, like Bitcoin prices fell like 50% in the course of that month. And you know what? Nobody sold like these lunatics held on to that. He's like, I, you know, I've never seen anything like this and whatever it is, I've got to buy it because these are lunatics. I want to be in there with this, uh, this sort of crowd that just doesn't get shaken out. So, um, he entered the space and then he was actually first. And then Michael Saylor also followed a uh, soon after, but once we covered that on orange Bowl podcast, once once Paul Tudor Jones came in, like that's the smart money. Like that's the really smart money institutional, like the not in, he's not institutional, but like in front of the institutions, he's the sort of guy that institutions would uh, consider, mm -hmm. well, if this guy yeah. is doing it, then we need to get into Bitcoin. Right, Max? Yeah, absolutely. You know, Paul Tudor Jones, I remember when he got into it, he's, he's a legendary trader and he went on CNBC and talked about it and, and, and the impact of the core owners and buyers of Bitcoin, the network effect. And Michael Saylor talks about this as well, the cyber hornets, as he calls them, and the hodlers. And there's a core 
um, kind of floor to Bitcoin. You know, during the era of the central bank supremacy, which is uh, from 1980 to 1922, so a 42-year reign of central banks in the world, there was something called the Greenspan put, which is that every time markets go down, the central banker, this was started by Alan Greenspan, would lower interest rates and bail out Wall Street. So they kind of like took a new direction for the Fed. The Fed, that wasn't really the Fed's job until we saw this phenomenon take place during the Greenspan years. And it's continued all the way up through current Fed chairman. Well, with Bitcoin, you have what's called really the Michael Saylor put. Mm -hmm. or let's call it the Larry Fink put. So every time the price, you see some price weakness, these guys come in with huge orders. So you've got huge orders coming in on any price weakness. And that's the floor. Like the floor is established. It's, it's not going to go beneath that floor because these bids are stacked up to buy the Bitcoin. And because they know now the jig is up. I mean, I would say this year now, finally, this, the major global institutional money understands now without any equivocation that Bitcoin is going to swallow the Forex market the same way the software industry swallowed the global industrial base, right? Every mm -hmm. software ate the world, right? Everything runs on software. And that started in the really 1970s. And then uh, Microsoft and Apple went public in the early 1980s i was a stockbroker at the time and the information age and software ate the world and you see those great photos of here's the 30 things you used to carry around with you which are now on your phone right so it's like it totally transformed everything well bitcoin is eating the forex market it's eating the global um kind of investment store of value, store of value and investment market which is approximately 400 trillion dollars in size so even at one and a half trillion dollars in market cap it still has a huge runway ahead of it and once people who manage money professionally understand that they have to start buying it it's their fiduciary responsibility to get exposure to this asset class if they do not they would be subject to really um anger from their clients who would say mm -hmm. you're violating your fiduciary responsibility <laughs> because we have no Bitcoin in the account and you've deprived us of that performance. So now you've got that all kicking in. But also, yeah, and it's also I want to bring up the fact that, like I said, Paul Tudor Jones noted that nobody was shaken out, right? These Bitcoiners, whoever they are, they were just kept holding. And that's uh, really important that the mindset of the Bitcoin community is ready for um, global dominance. Like we, we have, we have, the best perfect money. Um, when you think of the control that the price signal in financial in fiat fa financial markets has over the psychology and the mindset of the people that they can, can put greed or fear, greed or fear, greed or fear, they turn it on, they just swap, you know, a button, they press a button, yeah. and they lower interest rates, send, a, send a euphoria and greed throughout the entire economy. Then they put fear, they raise interest rates really fast um, in order to put, stoke fear into the population or they crash the markets uh, during, uh, you know, remember when Hank Paulson was looking for a $700 billion tarp that he they pulled the number out of thin air and uh, Congress said no. And then the markets crashed. And then they said yes the following day because a whole bunch of people called them in fear of like, oh, my God, my portfolio is going down. Uh, the same thing happened with the bond vigilantes. Like they crashed the bond market back in '92, and they they forced Bill Clinton down from some of his acts. But Bitcoiners, like because it's not a price that they're looking at, but the amount of Sats that they hold, the percentage of the of the 21 million Bitcoin that they hold, um, it's a it's a different way, like a, a different mindset, a different way of being that we're more sovereign and independent in general, obviously now with the ETFs and a, a new wave of every cycle brings in a new wave of participants and every new set of participants in the first bull market will tend to uh, obviously be more, you know, more fiat mindset. They might be more fear and greed driven. So, um, you know, at the, 
margin there, you're going to see more volatility. Um, a lot of those very newbies, for example, did sell. There was a huge sell-off by them, by the minnows in, in January when the ETF, Bitcoin ETFs were launched and the mainstream media said, oh, it was kind of a dud and they all sold. So, uh, you know, bizarrely, and then you could see because of on-chain analysis, you could see it was uh, smaller holders that were selling. Um, but Presumably those were newbies who had gotten in and they were just, maybe they got in at 19,000 and they were happy with 40,000. They're like, why well, I, I doubled my money and, and my fiat money and, and uh, I'm happy. Um, but what they, they hadn't yet understood the new paradigm that you want as many sats as possible rather than a, as a dollar value. Yeah. You know, Stacy brought up an interesting point there about, People on Wall Street, people in finance can push a button and make markets go up, markets go down. Yeah. And um, this is um, probably not well understood that um, they call it program trading. That's a common phrase, but program trading is just really market manipulation or high frequency trading is another form of market manipulation. And it all started in 1987. In 1987, there was a massive crash, a 21, 22% intraday crash of the stock market in the United States. And the lessons learned from that crash is that my god you know that accidental crash and it, what happened was the computers in new york and the computers in chicago got into contentious doom loop if you will and they were feeding off each other and you had this crash this epic crash and what the lesson learned was you know what that was an accident but what if we could do that on purpose you know if we can make markets drop 20 percent or rise 20 percent by this computer manipulation and information manipulation you know it gives us incredible power and since that time and by the way in the 1997 crash it was the first time in history that the federal government stepped in and started buying s p futures contracts to bail out the stock market so price discovery ended on october you know the day after the monday after the friday of, of the stock market crash pippa malgram who's a market observer and writes a lot has done some work on this and talks a lot about how the s p futures contracts purchased by the federal government kind of ended free markets in america so a lot of people say you know capitalism sucks well we don't have capitalism we have something different and anyway so the markets are manipulated in this way the long-term trend you know you can't stop it like the markets are on a longer term trend they will kind of seek out value as uh, Warren Buffett says, I believe it, the, the phrase is, in the short term, markets are a voting machine. In the long term, markets are a weighing machine. Uh, but in, in the interim, you get the volatility. And that volatility, 90% of it, is, is, is synthetic. It's created by players on Wall Street who are capturing the gains for themselves. And that money, of course, goes into lobbying Washington to pass more laws to make it easier to manipulate the stock market. So this is the doom loop we're in right now well, financiers that have completely undermined the economy. And the result is incredible dysfunction and dislocation and wealth concentration, the dangerous wealth con con concentration that we're experiencing now. Yeah. And I, I, I want to add to this before we, we, we go to what they just said in Korea, but the thing that, that made what, what you both pointed out, what Paul Tudor Jones noticed in four years ago was like, wow, these people held. They didn't, there's this, this group of crazy Bitcoiners that held. And as someone who's only been in the space but four or five years, it was a year and a half ago when the FTX thing happened. And I was like, everyone was flipping out around me. And I was like, the fact that the floor is 16,000, that's pretty amazing considering like it should have gone to zero, whatever. And I go, the fact that, again, there was this even bigger group of like, we're not, we're, you know, and we're not selling and people were buying. I mean, that same group was like, oh, we'll buy this dip. We'll buy this dip. And the thing I love about Bitcoin, that's not some sort of like secret thing that you have to kind of, it's, it's all transparent. So the people that like Paul Tudor Jones and Michael Saylor, and as you say, all of these other people in institutional money or that manage institutional money, they're reading the same stuff and they're seeing, you know, that's the thing I love about Bitcoin. You can go, look how much Bitcoin has just been staying in cold wallets, not moving, not moving at all. It's just huge percentages. And that tells uh, these traditional investors, oh, these, these Bitcoiners, the, and the, the, the core hodlers to me seems like it just keeps growing and growing. The people that are waking up to this, like don't sell, just stack sats. Yeah. Well, one interesting uh, 
a possibility could be a massive psyop because uh, in a false market signal. So maybe what Michael Saylor saw and maybe what Paul Tudor Jones saw when he looked at the market and noticed that nobody was selling is that nobody could find their keys. So therefore they were unable to sell or they wow. lost their keys. They lost their keys. They couldn't find their keys. They lost the keys. So he looked at it and he doesn't really know enough about Bitcoin to know maybe that this is the outcome of this is the situation and nobody could find their keys to sell. So the price got stuck and he looked at it and said, oh my God, the conviction is so high. I'm going to buy. <laughs> I mean, no one has made that point ever until just now, Graham, on the Orange Pill podcast. But <laughs> that's why this show's great, because you make points that uh, nobody else comes up with.